Psalms 118, verse 24, this is the day which the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Welcome to a place of faith, love, and community. We are glad that you are here joining us in worship and fellowship today. Before we go further, we would like to ask everyone to take 30 seconds to greet each other. 30 seconds. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Let's be seated as I read the announcements for this week. Thank you. Our first announcement for the day is our, regarding our Bible study, join us for an, ex, an enriching exploration of the profound doctrine of the Trinity at the Bible school. We'll, we delve in its, into greatness and amazement over the next four uh, Tuesdays, starting from this Tuesday. This is a wonderful opportunity to deepen your faith. Our Bible school sessions will be held every Tuesday at 7 p.m. at the church office. We extend a warm invitation to everyone who wish to attend. If you require the address for the church office, please don't hesitate to reach out to Pastor Roger. We look forward to welcoming you. Our next announcement, save the date. In just two weeks on October 8th, we'll be celebrating the child dedication for Joseph Jr. Join us in commencing this special occasion for the Amano family. The Amano family won't be having a family fellowship, just the child dedication. <laughs> After uh, the service today, we're going to brunch at La Casa Restaurant. <laughs> yum, yum. Right here in Bronxville. If you're new to our church and would like to connect with fellow members, this is a wonderful opportunity to do so. We look forward to welcoming you. Please ask Priscilla or Pastor Roger for directions if you need it. We'll have a, a petite gift box for collecting presents uh, meant for baby Joseph to be presented during his dedication ceremony next Sunday. If you'd like to bring a little gift, kind of leave it in the cardboard box positioned at the rear hospitality table on that Sunday. Tithes and offering, very important here. Tithes and offerings are ways to support the church. You can give via the church website you, or use a QR code or just put it in an envelope and drop it in the basket at the welcome table. Let us pray. Our Father and our God, we thank you for bringing us together to worship with you, to worship you, Lord Jesus, uh, today. We thank you, Lord, for bringing us through the week, for keeping us and protecting us. Lord, we ask that as our pastor come to deliver uh, your word to us, Lord, we ask that you open our, our eyes, our ears, and our hearts, Lord, to receive your word, and we glorify your name in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll now sing the doxology 
and after which we will, uh, the next voice we hear will be our Pastor Roger. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Just the voices. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Amen. Amen. Good morning, church. I'm going to welcome Andrea to come up and uh, read our scripture passage for today. Really want you guys to pay attention to this one. Uh, we have quite a bit of scripture to cover today. If you have the QR code, it's going to be helpful. I think it's like 12 or 14 scriptures. Uh, it'll make it a lot easier. So a um, lot of great meat today. Let me pray again as Andrea comes and reads our central passage. We won't read all 14 passages. Uh, we'll read the main text, um, and then we'll use all the other supporting texts to, to, to prove the main text. Father, thank you so much for today. Thank you for the opportunity to bask under who you are. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to have our minds renewed by who you are. God, thank you for the opportunity to have spiritual meat today, uh, Lord, so that we could be more effective missionaries during our week. And all this we ask under the power of your precious Holy Spirit and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. Let's welcome Andrea as she comes up. John 15, 1 through 11. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it so that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it unless it abides in the vine. So neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away as a branch and dries up. And they gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned. If you abide in me, and my word abides, and my words abide in you. Ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. Just as the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be made full. Well, good morning, Bronxville Community Church. Amen, amen. Welcome to our Jesus party. Hey, turn to your neighbor, give them a little side fist pump. Don't punch them too hard. Yeah, long distance high five. 
Yeah, I see you, Joe, back there. Laura, plastic man, reaching you. Okay, all right. How's everyone doing? Amen. All right, we're getting ready to go into God's Word here. We're excited. Man, Temeskin's in the house. It's going to be a special day. <laughs> Temeskin's like, that's the last time I walk in <laughs> this late. <laughs> All right, here we go. Here we go. Well, preacher and teacher. Let me pray one more time, actually. There's a lot going on in this message. There's a lot of me today. Father, just thank you for your word. Uh, thank you for the vine. Thank you that we're connected to the vine. Um, and uh, thank you that you can't remove us from the vine. We're connected. And then because we're connected, we get pruned. And pruning hurts. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Yes, it does. <laughs> yes, it does. All right, it hurts. Uh, well, the great preacher and teacher Charles Spurgeon said, there is no joy in this world like union with Christ. The more we feel it, the happier we are. The more we feel it, the happier we are. That's my goal this morning. That's my goal this morning. My goal is that you would feel union with Christ and that you would feel it so much that it renews your minds and defines your very identity. Think about that. Your identity is union with Christ. You see, it's because of union with Christ that that old nature that we were talking about, remember that old nature? It's because with union with Christ that that nature is dead. And some of you who are joining us, we've been talking about the Apostle Paul saying that every single person has two natures. They have a flesh nature, and they have a spirit nature. You can't help it. And, that's, and we were talking about that's why we love the Bible so much, because the Bible's real. We do have a flesh nature. Any religion that you go to that says, you know, one day you'll, you won't have any flesh nature, run away. We do. But union with Christ kills that flesh nature. That's the powerful thing. Union with Christ kills that flesh nature. And, and we walk completely in our new identities in Christ. Somebody say amen. amen. Uh, Paul calls this the great exchange. This is what's called the great exchange. And here's what I mean by it. The righteous life that you could not live. Somebody saying amen? Couldn't live it. God gives you by smearing your horrible sins on his innocent son, Jesus. And then he has him voluntarily take the penalty of death for your sins. Jesus takes the blow for you. Jesus takes the beating for you. Jesus takes the death sentence for you. And then God gives you Jesus, his son's sinless righteousness that you are now declared clean righteous, and brand new. And all this is not of your works at all. That's the thing. That's the thing that makes this so, so amazing. It's not of your works at all. It's completely the work of God himself in Christ and the Holy Spirit. Why? Why would he do that? Why would he do that? Because he is the one that formed us from the dust of the ground, and he is the only one that can determine a solution to redeem us. You guys catch that? That's an amazing spiritual principle. Because he's the one that formed us from the dust of the ground, God Almighty, therefore he's also the one that can come up with a solution to redeem us, God Almighty. It's nothing of yourself. I was reflecting in the Bible college um, a few weeks ago that it, it, it occurred to me that in Genesis, it says that God took Adam from the dust and breathed in him the spirit and he became a living being. You know what that means, guys? Without the spirit, you ain't nothing. You ain't nothing. You're dust without the spirit in you. Um, I went to a prestigious Ivy League school where they taught me that I'm something. I'm something, I'm something, I'm something all the time. I'm missing the point. All my gifts and ability are nothing without the Spirit in me. Tap your neighbor, give him a high five again. This is good. 
This is good. We're going deep in, guys. We're going deep. We're going deep. Put your scuba deer on. We're going deep. All right. All he asks is that we would believe. Believe what? Believe what? Believe in the incredible grace of God, in the incredible kindness of Jesus, and make this proclamation, yes, 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 and yes. That's it. Isn't that amazing? All he wants us to do is believe and say yes. Get your stinking person out of the way, Roger. I'm talking to this Roger. There's a Roger here. <laughs> so I'm looking, at, I'm looking at, I'm saying Roger, and Roger's like, yes, amen. <laughs> I'm talking to myself. We have a few Rogers here. The other Roger didn't even respond. I'll get you. I'll get you soon, brother. I got one for you. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, we say yes, and this new life has started in you. You now have a new commander-in-chief. You now have a new human resource manager. You now have a new CEO. You now have a new purpose. You now have a new reason for life. You, know, you now have a new objective, goal, and purpose. You now have a new joy in your life. You now have a new purpose for living. And watch this. You now have a new way of looking at sin. Sin is literally now a dead person that you no longer need to listen to. Why? Why? Because you are so enthralled, and I had to look at synonym for enthralled. It's such a good word. And here's what I found. It's such a good word, Yelly Bell. Glued. You are now glued to the new life in Christ. You want some more motivation? How about gratitude? So simple, yet so life-changing, this gospel. The same God who created us died so that we could enjoy an incredible life with him. And out of that joy, we love others. The same God who created us died. Get that in your spirit. Zero. You had nothing to do with it. It's all on him. It has to be on him, Jay. Because if, it's, if, it's, if there's an ounce of it that's on us, we're going to mess it up. It is completely on him. He formed you from dust, and therefore the one who formed you from dust is the only one that can come up with a solution to save you. It is completely on him. And you know why that's so awesome, Freddie? Because if it's completely on him, I'm blown away. And I'm filled with gratitude. And it is that gratitude that motivates me to love. See, the kind of love that people need must come from something other than yourself. It must be an other type of love. It is a divine love. People, you know, husbands and wives, people don't actually need the love that you have because your love is limited. You know what they need? Agape love. They need, I tell this, I tell people this all the time. I'm going to say it again. I have a, I'm doing a marriage here in about um, two months, and I'm going to say it like this. Folks, love your, love God more than you love your wife. And you will naturally love your wife. Wives, love your, love God more than you love your husband. And you will naturally become the woman that he's always needed all his life. It's an agape love. It has to be sourced completely in God. It must be sourced completely in God. I want to read some scriptures, and I want these scriptures just to, to, to heal you, to just wash over you. These scriptures are just reinforcing everything I just said, starting with Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. I have been crucified with Christ. And it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself up for me. 
The next verse I want to look at is 2 Corinthians 5, verses 16 to 21. This is all in your QR code. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5, verses 16 to 21. Coincidentally, when I first got saved in college, uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 17 was the verse we had to memorize. We, in our campus, they give us these little cards, and we had to memorize them. And 2 Corinthians 5, 17 was the one I had to memorize, Johnny. Uh, Therefore, from now on, we recognize no one according to the flesh. You see, when we look at people now, when we look at our brothers and sisters here, we think about the fact of what God has done. We, before I look at anybody here, I'm thinking about, this is the way we should do this, I'm thinking about God dying on the cross for me. And now you look at everybody with love. Therefore, from now on, we recognize no one according to the flesh, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him in this way no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. New creature. New creature. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. Now all these things are from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. This is so good. He gave us the ministry of reconciliation, right? So, so here's what happened. The Trinity, right, God reconciles us back to him. And then he gives us a job to do. He gives us a ministry, Joseph. He gives us the ministry of reconciliation. We're supposed to go tell people about this reconciliation that you can have with God. We have a job, and it's called the ministry of reconciliation. It says, we need to go tell people, did you know that there was a God who wants you to have a relationship with you? And you don't have to fight and struggle it for it. He's already done it. Will you accept that incredible grace of God? And they say yes, and their life changes. That's the job that we have. Uh, Christians, our job is not just to stay here. I love it. I love when we stay here. I love our parties. I love our fellowship. But our job is to be missionaries. Our job really, I mean, don't listen to Pastor Roger. Uh, listen to Paul. Namely, that God was reconciling the world in Christ. Um, where is it? Verse 18. Um, uh, through Christ and gave us, 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 the ministry of reconciliation. Go tell people this exciting news. Namely, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. There you go. Not counting their trespasses against them, them, and he has committed to us, what is it? The word of reconciliation. He's committed it to us. You know why I say that? Not to beat you guys up, but to tell you, you have a purpose. You have a purpose. Have you ever, you don't have to raise your hand, I'll raise it for you. Have you ever woke up in bed one time and you said, I don't feel like I have a purpose today? This is where scripture speaks to me. Yes, I do have a purpose. It's to tell people about the ministry of reconciliation. We have a purpose. Verse, verse 20, therefore we are ambassadors. We are ambassadors. Uh, ambassador is somebody from another nation who is representing this nation right? That nation in another nation. Sojourners is another word. Visitors. But we're representing the kingdom of God here. We beg you. Man, Paul is saying, I beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God. Galatians 5, 22 to 24. Galatians 5, 22 to 24. This is so good. Galatians 5, 22 to 24. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, Hey, if you're like me, you're reading these things and you're like, God, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I, I, didn't, I, I didn't hit all these this week. I didn't hit them all this week. 
and, and it's, it, it's amazing. That's okay, guys, because that, that thing in you that's saying, I'm sorry, is the Holy Spirit. And that's a wonderful thing. That's a wonderful thing. You see, union with Christ is not just some on-the-shelf doctrines that theologians talk about and then they have to pull it off and dust it off. No, union with Christ is your very identity. It's the thing that can help you say no. No, no, no. No to sin. As Paul states in Romans chapter 8, 35 to 37, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? This, this is good, right? This gospel that we were talking about, Liz, this gospel, listen, Paul says, who can separate you from that gospel? Shall tribulation, anybody have some tribulation this week? Yeah? Guess what? Tribulation can't separate you from the gospel. Tribulation can't separate you from what God did. It can't. It can't. Distress. Anybody have a little stress this week? Yeah, I know you guys did. Guess what? Stress, the worst stress, Freddie and Gildo, can't undo the gospel. It can't undo the gospel. Can't. Persecution. Anybody felt like they've been persecuted this week? Maybe at work? Maybe your boss? Guess what? Persecution can't undo the gospel. Famine. Maybe one day we're going to end up in famine in our country. Guess what, Christians? Can't undo the gospel. Nakedness, danger or sword. Maybe one day we'll get attacked by a foreign country in this land. Can't undo the gospel. For your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. Just so you know, in your Bible that's italicized, that's because he's quoting Psalm 42, 22 right now. And then it goes back and says, no, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Um, take a moment now, church, and reflect. What do these truths that we've been talking about, watch this, what do they tell you about your sin now? If you reflect on these truths, what does it tell you about your personal sin? Do the words of Solomon come to mind? Meaningless. 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 Utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. Ecclesiastes 1, 2. Do those words come to mind when you think about sin? Solomon says these words, by the way. You're, you're probably wondering, whoa, this is the same guy that wrote Proverbs? Yeah, because he's much older now. In Proverbs, he was a younger king. Now he's a much older king, and in his age, he has walked away from God, like we always do, right? We're like, God, help me. I don't need you anymore. And now he's an older man, and he's reflecting, my life is meaningless without union with Christ. Meaningless. Everything is meaningless. There's no fruit. There's no fruit. And speaking of fruit, that takes us to our core passage today, John chapter 15. Now, we've been talking about how the Apostle Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, talks about union with Christ. I thought it would be cool to hear about what Jesus has to say about union with Christ. And that comes from John chapter 15. John chapter 15 is part of what we call the upper room discourse. It's called the upper room discourse. All right? It's the upper room discourse. Uh, the reason why it's called the upper room discourse is because you're getting a sneak peek in John chapter 14, 15, 16, and 17. Those, those uh, four verses, McKenna, is actually Jesus' last night with the 12 disciples before he's crucified at the Last Supper. What's he going to tell them? What is he going to tell them knowing that these are the folks that's been so glued to him and he's about to leave and go atone for the sins of humanity and they're going to be by themselves? What does he tell them to comfort them? Can you imagine? What, do you, what does he tell them? And this is what he says. I am the true vine. My father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. 
And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it so that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away as a branch and dries up. And they gathered them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified in this. My Father is glorified in this. Isn't that amazing? You want to glorify the Father? Abide in Jesus. My Father is glorified in this, that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. Just as the Father has loved me, I, I have also loved you and abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you so that my joy may be complete in you and that your joy may be made full. Okay, so this morning I want to look at verses 1 to 4. I don't have time to teach on all of it. Uh, next week we'll look at 5 to 11, but we're going to look at verses um, uh, 1 to 4. First of all, I have a question to ask you guys because before we even get into this church, why does Jesus speak in parables? I mean... Jesus is with the 12. He's been walking with them for about three years. Wouldn't it be just easier, Dom, to just say, hey, you know, I'm God in human form. If you abide in me, right, you will have a life of full abundance. No, he doesn't do that. He doesn't do that, Laura. He doesn't do that. And, and what's with all this gardening stuff? Vine, gardener, branch, Soil, pruning. Lord, you know I don't have that spiritual gift. Every time I go to Home Depot, right, I pick another tropical plant, hoping this might be the time when it lasts more than two weeks. <laughs> and it never does. So now I have tropical plants in my house, uh, artificial tropical plants. But So the answer is, why does God speak in parables? Why does Jesus speak in parables? Because he wants to. That's the real answer, right? Because he wants to. He can do whatever he wants. But I want you to look at Matthew chapter 13, verse 11 with me. Matthew chapter 13, verse 11. And in Matthew chapter 13, verse 11, the disciples actually asked him, Lord, why do you speak in parables? And look what he says. It's, it's, it's fascinating. And this is really going to give you guys some healing. Everyone there? Matthew 13, 11, say amen. amen. This is how Jesus answered. Jesus answered them, to you it has been granted to know the mysteries of of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been granted. To you it has been granted to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been granted. Listen very carefully. Parables are earthly stories about heavenly principles. And, and Jesus says, to you it has been granted. Jesus intentionally uses stories because he knows the believers in the crowds are going to hear so much more from the Holy Spirit. You see, parables are stories that leave room for the Holy Spirit so that when you hear it, you're going to say, this is more than just having a green thumb. Thank God for me. It's more than just having a green thumb. This says so much more. And so Jesus is already doing this in the later part of his ministry, Jay, because he's like, I want the Holy Spirit to already start working in the children. A parable is a gift to us, brothers and sisters, because a parable is something we read and we're about to say, oh gosh, God is so good. I see so much more in this. That's why a parable is so amazing. That's why a parable is so incredible. Um, parables are for your benefit, Christian. Parables are, are there to intentionally leave room for the Holy Spirit to work on you and to lead you to greater truth about God. Look at verse uh, 12 of that same passage, Matthew 13, verse 12. Look what it says. 
For whoever has to him, more shall be given. See? When you read a parable, if you have the Holy Spirit, you're going to have more. More than just about gardening. Maybe someone who doesn't have the Holy Spirit just sees gardening. But if you have the Holy Spirit, you're going to have more. But whoever does not have, even what he has shall be taken away from him. Parables are stories using common things that are familiar, like salt, bread, sheep, and vines, to allow the Holy Spirit to see, to help you see more of Jesus. Okay, let's look at this parable, all right? This parable is about being in Christ. And I want you all to try to see the deeper meaning in this parable, okay? Here we go, here we go. Holy Spirit, come to my brothers and sisters. I want them to see the deeper meaning here. Here we go, you ready? You guys ready? All right, here we go. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Anyone see the Trinity here? I never thought besides that this was a Trinitarian verse. I have struggled for so long for an analogy for the Trinity, and I was like, oh my gosh, Jesus gives us analogies. Anyone see the Trinity here? This is so beautiful. The word vine dresser in the Greek is the word gardener. Some of your translations say gardener. Jesus says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. This passage is very similar to the passage we read last week in John chapter 10, verse 27 to 30. You don't have to turn there. Listen with me. It's a very similar concept. Um, John, has, John has little images of the Trinity throughout the whole book, by the way. Okay? Um, listen to what Jesus says in John chapter 10. This is very similar. Jesus says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give eternal life to them, and they will never perish. Watch this. And no one so snatch them out of my hand. That's what Jesus says. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one should snatch them out of the Father's hand. Now watch this. I and the Father are one. Ooh, Karen got it. The Father and Son form one hand. The Father and Son are described as one system and one essence. Now in this passage, the Father and Son are one system of gardening. The Father's hand, the plant, it's all one. It's all one. One. It's the Trinity, a beautiful image of the Trinity. Do you see how cool parables are? Without the Holy Spirit, an individual might miss the point and think this is just about having a green thumb. These are stories that make room for the Holy Spirit to teach us more about God. Let's look at verse 2. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. So Jesus is the vine, and we are the branches. Now, now can you imagine that? Let me come here to help you guys here. Jesus is the vine, and we are the branches. Can you imagine uh, the spiritual life-giving juices that are coming from, from the vine to the branches? Can you imagine that? Can you imagine those juices that are coming from, the, from this vine to the branches? I think those juices are the Holy Spirit. I think they're the Holy Spirit. So does Ezekiel, by the way. So does Ezekiel. Um, you, you don't have to turn here. Just listen with me. Put it in your notes. Ezekiel 36, 27. Go back and read that. Here this prophet Ezekiel is, is, is prophesying about the role of the Holy Spirit in people's lives. Look what he says. Look what he says. I will put my spirit within you. Here's the good part. And cause you. To walk in my statues and you will be careful to observe my my ordinance the Holy Spirit is the one that causes you to follow Jesus not yourself so watch here's the vine you're the branch the juices that flow between the vine and the branches is the Holy Spirit and it's those juices that cause you to follow the Word of God it's the juices. It's the Holy Spirit. 
It's the Holy Spirit. And since we can never be separated, according to Romans 8, remember that last week? We can never be separated, right? It leads most scholars and myself to conclude that what we're talking about here, every branch of me that doesn't bear fruit, these are people that were never really properly attached to the vine in the first place. Scripture doesn't contradict itself. If you're connected to the vine, you cannot be separated. So how does the father cut the branch? These are people who had never really connected to the vine in the first place. But you, brothers and sisters, you have had fruit in your life. Okay? Now, now this, is, this is, don't miss this. This is really important, okay? You have had fruit in your life. Now, some of you might say, Pastor Roger, I don't feel like I had fruit this week. All right? Amen? Some of you might say that, but here's the deal. Here's the deal. Here's what I want to ask you. Here's what I want to ask you. Have you ever had fruit? Yeah. The only way you could have fruit is if you were connected to the vine. Maybe you had a bad week, but you had fruit in the past, didn't you? So you're connected to the vine. Maybe you had a bad week, right, Jay? But guess what? I know if you think back in your history, you can think of at least one or two, three times you had fruit. You know what that means, Jig? You're connected. You're connected. But all you guys are like so happy. I'm connected. Woo, I can go home. Guess what? That means you're getting pruned. You're going to get pruned. You're going to get pruned. Um, look at, um, look at um, verse uh, 2b. 2b. In the military, we say bravo, too bravo, too be. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it so that it may bear fruit. Every branch, that's us, that bears fruit, that's us. We have bear fruit before, God will prune you. Are you okay with God pruning you? Have you come to a life where you're like, God, prune me some more? Prune me, please, God. Are you, have you gotten to a point, or are you still running away from pruning? You know, it's tough. It's tough, right? If you guys are like me, when you mess up, it hurts, because you realize you mess up. It hurts. But thank God for the Holy Spirit, because if I didn't have that realization, I would just keep messing up. You get pruned. And I had to look up pruning, because I'm, <laughs> I'm not a gardener. I had to look up what pruning was. Joanne's laughing at me. Uh, and here's what I found out. Pruning looks like it hurts. Can you imagine someone taking uh, scissors, Johnny, that look like pliers and, and cutting you up? I don't want that. And here's something interesting about pruning. When a gardener prunes, um, Dom, you know this, when they prune, and Andrea probably knows, Maria knows this, I'm sure. When, when she's watching, Maria, you know this. When, when, a, when, when, a gardener, when, when a gardener prunes, they don't just cut anywhere. They cut underneath something called the leaf node. And the leaf node is right underneath the branch. Why? Because that's where the hormones are. And so the gardener intentionally cuts at the leaf node where most of the hormones are. And, and when you cut at the, the leaf node, it causes new growth. When God convicts us, he prunes us at our leaf node where it hurts the most. He will cut you where it hurts the most. And he does that so that new growth will come. New growth will come. This reminds me of an amazing scripture, and here I do want you to turn to this one. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. When I get about three people say amen, I know we're there. All uh, right. Jay's, Jay's just saying amen. All right. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. We there? Okay, here we go. For the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. Picture like Game of Thrones, right? A, a, a sword that has two edges on it, right? Watch this. And this sword, which is the Word of God, pierces the division of soul and spirit. Soul and spirit. And this is really cool, guys. Um, this is church. 
the soul is made up of three parts, okay? I don't know if you know this. Some of you guys, yeah, yeah, mind, will, and emotions. If I were to look at your soul, it has mind, will, and emotions. So the Word of God is so powerful, it goes down into your mind, will, and emotions. And when it gets there, it's like, oh, there's something else besides the soul. There's the spirit. And the Word of God is able to separate between your mind, will, and emotions and your spirit. Because the spirit is the governor over your soul. The Spirit is the thing that influences your soul this way or that way, and the Word of God is so powerful it can penetrate that separation between spirit and soul. That's how powerful the Word of God is. Um, let's look at look what else. Um, of, both bo joins, uh, of both joints and marrows, look at this. Able to judge the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. The Word of God is able to take your thoughts and your plans, and the Word of God is able to say, whoa, 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 whoa. You think that's a good plan, don't you? Your plan is riddled with me, 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 me. You think it's a great plan, right? Word of God is able to go that deep. Proverbs 16, the plans of the heart belong to man but the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. All the ways in a man are clean in his own sight, but what? The Lord weighs the motives. The, the, the Word of God is able to say, even though I have a plan, I have my vision board, right? The Word of God is able to go that deep and say, that's a selfish vision. The Word of God can go that deep and restore us. Only the Word of God can go that deep. Isn't this Word of God powerful? This makes perfect sense of verse 3. Now verse 3 just makes sense. Look at verse 3. You are already clean. The word clean means pruned, okay? You are already pruned. Jesus is looking at his disciples and said, I don't, I'm not going to have to prune you guys. You're already pruned. You're pruned because of my words, right? Because of the word I've spoken to you. Every word that comes from Jesus' mouth prunes us. The whole entire Bible is the word of God. The whole Bible is the Word of God, from Genesis to Revelation, not just the red letters. All of it. All of it is the Word of God. You are already pruned because of the Word of God. This is what theologians call sanctification. Lastly, I want us to listen to verse chapter 4, and we'll land the plane here. Verse chapter 4. This is so good. This might be the verse that you walk away with all of this from. I think it is. I think this is the application verse. Verse 4, abide in me, abide in me. In the Greek, that word abide means wait and endure in me. Jesus is looking at us and saying, I'm a branch, I mean, I'm a vine, you're a branch. Though there might be a lot of things out there that look attractive, there might be a lot of sinful things there that, that, that might tempt your heart. Though there might be a lot of opportunities that other people who are not Christians are doing, and you're like, oh, God, maybe I could do this once. And Jesus says, rest in me. Wait in me. Remember the umbrella analogy? Stay here with me. And I'll take care of the rest. That's all he asks us to do. Stay here with me in the vine. If you stay here with me in the vine, the spiritual juices which are the Holy Spirit will flow and fruit will come. The only thing Jesus is asking you to do, brother, sister, is wait, abide, remain. And he takes care of the rest. Let's pray. God, thank you. Thank you for these truths. Thank you for these beautiful truths, God. And Lord, we will rest in you, mighty Trinity, Father, Son, and Spirit. We will remain in you. In Jesus' mighty name, amen.
just ask you to just keep standing here. We, we, we like to close with a little bit of Holy Spirit activation. It's, it's a time when the Holy Spirit can just pow, do something to you. Okay, I know I need a pow. Um, as, the, as the worship team uh, is playing in the background, just a couple things here I want to bring to your attention. This society that we live in is all about independence, right? I want to be independent. I want to be independent. I want to be independent. Be independent, be independent. Trying to produce fruit like this. It won't work. Don't make me cry. How many of you finally came to a point in your life where you're like, I've been trying to do that? And I'm so frustrated, Johnny and Freddie, because it just doesn't work. I tried this for about 19 years before I became a Christian. It didn't work. God wants to give you this. Here's the beautiful thing about it. He's done everything for you. Just say yes. Just say yes. Some of you just need to say yes. I'm going to pray for those who just need to say yes. Some of you have been a Christian forever. Some of you are saying yes for the first time. If so, I want to invite you after we're done to come up and uh, Joanne, Johnny, Jig, myself, Leanne, Dom, we'll be up here praying. Karen, if you're up here, someone's going to pray with you. Just say yes. That's all. It's so incredible. I was trained to think that I had to do so many things, John Bull, but all he wants me to do is say yes. If that's you, I want to pray for you right now. Father, I say yes. I can't wait for this week because I say yes. Yes to your gospel. Yes to your sacrifice. Yes to your son. Yes to the new life. Some of you are in another category. Some of you have been Christians for decades and you just feel dry. Feel like this a little bit. And you just want to go back to childlike faith again. Remember? Remember? The, remember? remember when Christianity had that new car smell? Yeah. If that's you, I want to pray. God, we say yes all over again. Yes to the gospel. Yes to the new life. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. You know what I want to do here? Um, Last category, verse 4, abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. Wait and endure in me. Some of you are saying, Pastor Roger, how long do I need to wait? I've been waiting so long for this depression to lift, for this restlessness to lift, for this anxiety to lift. How long do I need to wait for that promotion? I keep getting overlooked at work. And here's what Jesus says. you I want to pray for you mighty God Father Son and Spirit we will wait we will wait in Jesus name I'm going to leave about 45 seconds to a minute to reflect on the words that we talked about as the worship team ministers to us in their special way let God speak to you as you hear the Spirit speak to you Remember, the Spirit is the life juices coming from the vine.
at this time. Our great God, we um, we will wait. And if anything we remember from this message, we remember the fact that you did it all. Because you did it all, we are filled with gratitude. And the gospel is bigger than any offense that we could ever feel in our lives. The gospel is so much beautiful our hearts with that God. Help us to love somebody this week. Help us to love someone even today. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Give your neighbor a hug if they want one or a fist bump or a hand clap. God is in this place.